أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي سبني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our hereafter walkthrough series session number three So in our previous episode we discussed that you died you passed away So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qiyamah, كَلَّا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ التَّرَاقِ وَقِيلَ مَنْ فراق وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقِ وَالْتَفْسَتِ السَّاقُ بِالسَّاقِ إِلَى رَبِّكَ يَوْمَ إِذِنَ الْمَسَاقِ No, when the soul reaches to the collarbone, up to the throat in its exit, and it will be said, who can cure him and save him from death? And he, the dying person, will conclude that it was the time of parting, death, and one leg will be joined with another leg. SubhanAllah, this shows us that when you die, you will actually know it. Your brain will acknowledge the fact that you are dead. SubhanAllah, you will know that this is the time of departure, time to be separated from your family members. Yes, this is the time of Firaq. It's mentioned that now that you are in station number two at Barzakh, the grave, it's mentioned that whenever Uthman radiallahu an, he would stand over a grave, he would pass by a graveyard, he would weep until his beard would be wet. It was said to him, you remember paradise and hell. You remember Jannah and Nar, and you do not weep. But when you remember the grave, you weep. He said, I heard the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, the grave is the first stage of the hereafter. Whoever passes through it safely, whatever comes after that will be easier for him. But if he does not pass through it safely, whatever comes after that will be harder for him. He said, and I heard the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, I have never seen any disturbing scene more terrifying than the grave. So the question is, what happens to you immediately after death? It's mentioned that your respiration and blood circulation is going to cease. In the first hour, your body muscles will start to relax. Your eyelids will lose their tension. Your pupils will dilate. Your jaw might fall open and your skin will start to sag. Eyelids are amongst the first muscles Eyelids are amongst the first muscles to stiffen and subhanAllah, that's the reason why our Prophet ﷺ instructed us to close the eyelids of the deceased as soon as death takes place. Following that, your body temperature will start to drop with a linear progression. Approximately in the third hour after your death, Chemical changes within your body cells will cause your muscles to stiffen. A week after death, your skin will blister and a slightest touch can cause it to fall off. A month after death, your hair, nails and teeth will fall out. And eventually, you will become fossils. Of course, this information can vary based upon a person's age, weight, how his death took place, and other environmental factors. But just a food for thought. The body that we have now, we take care of it so much throughout our lives by feeding it, by cleaning it, grooming it. However, once we die, we will decompose. Yes, and that's our reality. We will decompose. Our beauty shall fade away. Our wealth shall dwindle amongst others. 
Our merits and certificates shall all stay behind. However, what shall remain? Our deeds. They will not decompose. They will stay with us throughout our hereafter walk through. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, three things follow a deceased person. Two of them return and one remains. His family, his wealth, and his deeds follow him. His family and wealth returns back, but his amal, his deeds remain. So let us carefully look at our amal. Just like our physical bodies, they need cleansing and grooming. Our hearts require washing away the stains of sins as well. So let us repent now, because that is the essential key to a happy, successful hereafter life. So before we proceed with our journey, let us take a quick glimpse of our itinerary one more time in order to know which station we are on. So our itinerary goes like this. Departure from this world at a specified time. Arrival at Barzakh at the prescribed time. Resurrection on the day of Qiyamah at a destined time. And finally, arriving at our last and final stop, Jannah or Naar. May Allah protect all of us from Naar. I mean. So now, after departing from the world, you have a transit at Barzakh. After ascending the seven skies, now your roof descends down to unite with your body in the grave. And this is the moment when you will undergo the grip of the grave. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Inna lil qadri Indeed, the grave has a grip on people. If anyone was to escape from it, it would be Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. Yet, he was squeezed once and then released. For a believer, this is a kind of hug. And the earth's hug is for a brief period of time for the believer, since we're all created from dust. But for a non-believer, it extends indefinitely till resurrection. By the way, who is Sa'd ibn Mu'ad radiallahu an, who's mentioned in this hadith? He was one of the leaders of the Ansar of Medina, who lived his whole life by sami'na wa ata'na, who lived by obedience, and he died as a martyr with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu mentions to us that even him, even Sa'd bin Mu'ad radiallahu an, even he wasn't spared from the grip of the grave. So this is something we all have to face. May Allah make it easy upon us. Ameen. So what will follow next? The Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam said, When a dead person is entered into his grave, he's made to imagine that the sun is setting. So he st sits up, rubbing his eyes, and says to the two angels, let me pray. A believer will feel as if the sun is about to set. So subhanAllah, now that you have died and buried, you will hasten to pray Salat al-Asr. So you will take permission from the angels. However, you will be told that before you do anything else, you need to take an examination. Now there is a huge lesson in this for us. A person is known for something he loves, something he does, until it becomes his identity. If you lived a life 
when your heart and mind was always attached to Salah. You made sure you never miss any Salah, even while going for a vacation. You were pre-planning as to how to perform your Salah during your road trip. Despite the circumstances, you are always punctual about your five salawat. Then this would be your state in your grave as well. SubhanAllah. You will be concerned to pray salah. SubhanAllah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. May Allah grant all of us the love of salah and khushur in our salah. Ameen. Now the next question is, what happens next? The examination. Once you are buried, you will be tested. And this is called fitnatul qabr. Please note that there is a difference between fitnatul qabr and adabul qabr. So we shouldn't confuse both these terms. Fitnatul qabr means the trial of the grave the questioning in the grave. And this is something which we all have to encounter. However, Adab al-Qabr refers to the torment of the grave, which will be given to some and not all. May Allah protect us from Adab al-Qabr. Ameen. The Prophet wasallam said, Indeed, it has been revealed to me that you will be tested in the grave to an extent near or similar to the trial of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Allahu Akbar. As we all know that the fitna of Dajjal is one of the greatest trials ever witnessed by mankind. It highlights to us that the trial of the grave will be something similar. So it is not going to be something easy. So what is this fitna? This is the exam taking place in the qabr by two invigilators, two angels by the name of Munkar and Nakir. The Prophet wasallam informed us in the following hadith about the details. He said, Two angels of severe reprimand then come to the believer and address him abruptly. So we can see that their appearance is going to be somewhat fearful. They make him sit up and ask him, Marabuk, who is your Lord? He replies, Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. They ask him, Ma dinuk, what is your deen? He replies, Deeni al-Islam, my deen is Islam. They ask him, Ma hadha rajulu alladhi bu'itha fikum? Who is that man who was sent to you? He replies, Huwa Rasulullah. He is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They ask him, Wa ma amaluk? And what did you do? He replies, Qara'tu kitab Allah. I read the book of Allah, believed in it, and obeyed it. And this will be the last trial to which a believer is subjected. A caller from the heaven announces, my servant has spoken the truth. He has spoken truthfully. So what does it mean? It means once we have answered these questions, the exam is over, subhanAllah. And it may seem pretty easy since this is not a very lengthy questionnaire. However, this exam will be passed only by those people who lived their life according to the answer key. And the answer key is following Allah and his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reading the quran and abiding by it yes there is no other cheat sheet to it many a times we're extremely worried for our worldly exams and we exert ourselves to the max 
in order to achieve the desired results. However, when it comes to the Barzakh exam, we are pretty lax about it. Our mother Aisha, radiallahu an, Ummul Mu'mineen, listen to what she says. She said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, you tell us that we will be tested in our graves. What would be my position that when I am a weak woman? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, Allah keeps the believers firm with the firm words in the first life and in the last one. La ilaha illallah. Who is saying this, by the way? Aisha radiallahu anha, one of the top narrators of a hadith, a woman scholar of her time, a zahida, an abida. If she feels that she is weak, then what about us? If she is fearing this trial, then what about us? May Allah strengthen our iman. Ameen. So now that your family members and friends are departing, what is the advice our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave to the people who are now about to leave the cemetery? He said, seek the forgiveness of Allah for your brother and then implore that he be granted firmness of words. For indeed, he is being questioned now. SubhanAllah, this is true empathy, true sincerity, true love. Not to just leave your loved one immediately after burial, rather to stay there for some time and to pray for their questioning, pray for their exam. This is true love. This is true empathy. May Allah grant all of us istiqama. May Allah enable all of us to pass this test with the flying colors. Amin. So the question is, is there anyone who is protected from the fitna of the grave, from the interrogation of the angels? Yes. The prophets, the shuhada, the martyrs, the murabitun. The Nurabitun are those people who died in a state of guarding for the cause of Allah. So now looking at each one of these categories, number one, the prophets of Allah. The prophets of Allah are special because they are in a mode of worship even in the realm of Barzakh. The difference between the prophet's life in Al-Barzakh and other believers is the fact that the prophets are granted the ability and merit to pray in their graves while the latter are made to sleep. What's the evidence for this? The evidence is found in the journey of Isra. When the Prophet ﷺ was going through the journey of Isra, he passed by the grave of Musa ﷺ. And he saw Musa alayhi salam praying in his grave. So yes, the prophets of Allah, they have a special case. And their status is of course amongst the highest category of the aliyyun. So in the case of our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are told that each time we recite the durood, there's an angel assigned with this task to convey our salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, say the salam upon me frequently because Allah has appointed for me an angel who stays by my grave. Whenever one of my followers, they say salam upon me, the angel says to me, O Muhammad, so and so has just said salam upon you. SubhanAllah. Imagine your name is being mentioned by the angels to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Barzakh. Wouldn't that make you feel special? 
Alhamdulillah, it truly will. So we should hasten on saying the durood as much as we can, while driving, while cooking, before and after making supplication, at the conclusion of salah, whenever and however we can, inshallah. And the shortest form to do it is by reciting Allahumma salli ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To category number two, the shuhada. Again, the martyrs, they have a special merit with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to us in a hadith, a shaheed is awarded seven favors by Allah. He is forgiven with the first gush of blood. He is shown his position in Jannah, protected from the torment of the grave, saved from the great fear on the day of judgment, adorned with the adornments of Iman, married to al hurul Ain, and allowed to intercede for 70 of his relatives. So again, the Shaheed, he is granted a lot of merits as well. At times, we wish to attain martyrdom, isn't it? Well, listen to this. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever honestly asks Allah for martyrdom, wishes for martyrdom, makes dua for martyrdom, Allah will give him the status of a martyr even if he dies on his bed. SubhanAllah. May Allah grant us martyrdom and save us from fitnat al qabr Regarding category number three, the murabitun, the Prophet ﷺ said, standing guard for one day and night is better than fasting the days and praying the nights of an entire month. And if he, the guard, dies, his good deeds that he used to do continue to accumulate for him until the day of judgment. He is provided with provisions from Jannah and he is saved from the interrogation of the angels in the grave. So this is the reward for Imurabit, who stood guard fi sabilillah. So from this we conclude that the prophets, the shuhada, the murabitun, they are secured from fitnat al-qadr. However, we will all undergo this examination. So now imagine that inshallah, you were able to answer all these questions correctly. Now, what is going to happen? Alhamdulillah, mashallah, once that you have received an A grade on your exam, then what will happen? The Prophet وسلم, said, a caller then calls from heaven saying, provide him, the believer, with furnishings from Jannah, clothe him with garments from Jannah, and open for him a door to Jannah. Thus he receives bliss and perfume from Jannah and his grave is spread to the limit of his eyesight. Before him appears a man with a handsome face, nice clothing and pleasant smell. He says to him, I bring you glad tidings that will please you. Tidings of the acceptance of Allah and gardens with eternal bliss. This is the day that you were promised. He responds, glad tiding from Allah be to you too. Who are you? Your face is one that brings good. He says, I am your good deeds. Ana amaluk, amaluka salih. I am your good deeds. By Allah, I only knew you to be quick in obeying Allah and slow in disobeying him. May Allah reward you with the best. SubhanAllah. The good deeds that you and I perform in dunya, they are going to give us good news in our grave, in our qadr. 
they are going to be a source of Bashara for us. Allahumma amin. And then a door is opened for him to Jannah and another one to the fire and he is told this, the fire would have been your dwelling if you had disobeyed Allah. But Allah has substituted it for you with this Jannah. When he sees what is awaiting him in Jannah, he says, Oh my Lord, speed up the arrival of the hour of resurrection so that I may rejoin my family and property. He's told by the angels, go to rest. Again, subhanAllah, this shows us that even though we're so apprehensive when we think about the grave, however, the grave can be a source of bliss or torment. And it is going to be a physical um, aspect of pleasure and a psychological good news as well. So in a psychological form, you will be told that had you disobeyed Allah, you would have been made to go to the fire. However, because you obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now your destiny is Jannah. So this is going to give him peace. It is going to give, give him mental solace. Plus, there's going to be physical pleasure as well. So the Prophet sallallahu mentions to us, his grave is then expanded for him to 70 cubits by 70 and is illuminated for him. He is told, go to sleep. He says, let me return to my people to inform them about my good condition. But they tell him, sleep as does a newlywed person who is only to be awakened by his dearest family member, i.e. his spouse. Thus, time passes as if it is but enough until Allah raises him from his resting place. His body is returned after the trial to the previous state of death, and his soul is placed with the other good souls, which are birds eating from the trees of Jannah. SubhanAllah. If you reflect upon this, 70 by 70 cubits is a huge room. We don't even have our own bedrooms as big as this. And this will be the state of the utmost righteous. However, based upon the religiosity of a person, his grave will be expanded accordingly. So inshallah, you will be told to rest like a bride. And the analogy given is of the wedding night to indicate that you will sleep in bliss, peace and serenity with the anticipation to be awakened by your beloved. Insha'Allah, may Allah grant all of us that kind of sleep in our graves. Amen. So again, it all boils down to one point, which is to prepare for death to deposit a lot of amal salih right now in order to cash them later in the hereafter, inshallah. So the next question is, will your soul meet the other souls of the deceased? So for example, once you are dead, will you be able to meet your deceased mother or father? Let's hear it from the blessed words of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, the malaika will ascend with your soul. And then they take this person's soul to the souls of the believers. They, the other souls, are happier to meet him as if to whom a beloved one returns after a long absence. Imagine that airport scene when you're meeting someone after a long time, how excited you are. 
So what would happen? These souls, they will ask him about their acquaintances on earth, saying, what happened to so-and-so? And then some of the souls will interrupt, leave him until he rests, because he was just in the grief of the world. Again, imagine one of those uncles of yours that you're all excited to ask this person who just recently met you at the airport. And you're asking all these questions about your relatives. How is she and how is he? And your uncle tells you, let him rest, let him chill, let him relax for a while. And then you can pose all these questions to him, right? SubhanAllah, that's the case which is going to be for the deceased souls of the righteous as well. So he, the newly deceased soul, after a short rest, he will respond. I left so-and-so alive on earth. So they, the other souls, they are elated. But if he says, so-and-so actually died, did he not come to you? They respond disappointedly, no, he was not brought to us. And the angels are going to say, he was taken to his mother, the fire. He was taken to the fire. It shows us that hashtag you, the newly deceased, will give your deceased relatives fresh news regarding the people of dunya whom you left behind. And subhanAllah, this explains why and how a deceased person may come in our dream comforting us and consoling us for some affliction that we're currently going through. And we wonder in amazement, but subhanAllah, how come they knew about this? According to the ulama, the souls of the deceased, they come to a specific place in a alam, in alam -e barza where the souls of the living ascend during their sleep, during their noon, and they both meet each other. This is when they are able to communicate with each other. So the long deceased will ask the newly deceased about the ones whom they love to inquire about. So they're going to ask, how is he doing? And how is she doing when you left them? And in another hadith of Tabarani, we come to know that the newly deceased person will even inform them about some of their actions. So he's going to say, yes, so-and-so, I found him doing good. However, so-and-so, I found her doing evil. Again, let's pause and think. There's a reflection for us. If someone remembers us with a positive connotation, Alhamdulillah, it really feels good. However, if we are remembered with a negative connotation, then it's embarrassing. It's not good. May Allah protect us. Ameen. It's mentioned that the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Darda radiallahu an, he used to say, Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from doing any deed that would shame me before my deceased friend, Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu an, at this point, had passed away. So this tells us that subhanAllah, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew this. And that's why they feared to be ashamed in front of the living and the dead. SubhanAllah, and this shows us how deep were their du'as, how careful they were in terms of their deeds. So by learning all this, we may wonder, do the deceased know everything about the living? And the answer is no. Even though there is some form of communication amongst the souls of the deceased, there's a barrier between the living and the dead. 
So of course, they don't know everything about the living, but they may be acquainted with the bits and pieces of information, whatever Allah wishes them to know. We should also remember that if you see a deceased loved one in your dream, this is a temporary meeting between the two. However, one should not base any action, acts of worship based on a dream because the dream might possibly be one's own imagination. But there is no harm in feeling happy and taking comfort in seeing someone in a dream. The Prophet ﷺ guided us to make dua for our deceased. Give sadaqah on behalf of the deceased, etc. May Allah forgive them all. Amen. Another question we may ask is, how do you define the journey of Isra wal Miraj when the Prophet ﷺ led salah for all the previous prophets? Can the living meet the dead in the physical realm of this dunya? The answer is no. This incident was specific to the Prophet ﷺ since the prophets of Allah are granted miracles. The whole journey of Isra wal Mi'raj was a miracle and gift to the Prophet ﷺ by Allah. During this journey, our beloved Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he met many deceased prophets and even interacted with them. So this was a special event altogether. However, we do not have the ability to communicate with the deceased because there is a barzakh, a barrier between the living and the dead. So yes, this was specific to the Prophet Wasallam during that incident. However, we, the living, cannot communicate with the deceased in the present realm of this dunya other than the dream, whatever and however Allah wills. So the next is the question regarding the darkness of the grave. Yes, technically the graves are pitch dark, but they can have light. How do we know this? We come to know about it from an incident which took place during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. When a woman passed away during the night, she was a person who used to clean the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And since it was nighttime, the Sahaba did not wish to disturb the Prophet. So they buried her. Later during the day, when the Prophet ﷺ noticed her absence, he inquired about her, and he was told what had happened. So he said, Indeed, these graves engulf their dwellers with darkness. And indeed, Allah illuminates them for them. The believers, because of my prayer for them. Again, there is a beautiful reflection in this for us. The Prophet especially went to pray janaza for this woman. Even though this woman is not someone like Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, he's not a well-known person like Aisha radiallahu anha, Ali radiallahu an, or Fatima radiallahu anha. Why? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still went to pray janaza for her because she used to clean the masjid. What does it tell us? It tells us that we should never belittle any good deed. There's a magnitude of reward attached for the maintainers of the masjid, the caretakers of the masjid, the providers of the masjid, the ones who clean it, the ones who take care of it. Insha'Allah, they will have light in their graves, insha'Allah. 
On the flip side, while the righteous believer is enjoying all this bliss, what will be the state of a non-believer? It is mentioned that a non-believer, as soon as he enters his grave, the grave tightens on him. A door leading to hell appears in his way. Grave is furnished with fire and poisons from hell. His evil deeds materialize next to him in the form of a repulsive man, and he receives a most painful punishment. So again, this torment of the grave is going to be physical and psychological. This will be the state of a non-believer, as well as the hypocrite, who pretended to have faith outwardly, but inwardly his heart was filled with kufr and nifaq. May Allah protect us. Amen. The Prophet وسلم, said, Indeed, this community, the dead, they are afflicted in the grave. Were it not that you might stop burying each other from fear, I would have asked Allah to make you hear the torture of the grave as I do. Astaghfirullah. May Allah protect all of us from the torture of the grave. Amen. So now that we have discussed all this regarding the na'im of qabr, the bliss of qabr, and the adab of qabr, we may question, is there any adab for the Muslims? And the answer is yes. There are specific deeds which carry a punishment with them. If a person indulges in them and dies without repentance, he will be punished in their grave. So we will list out the reasons, and all these are established through authentic narrations of a hadith, so there is no ambiguity regarding it. So they are, number one, not saving oneself from urine, meaning being careless about cleaning oneself properly after using the restroom. A person who indulges in nanima, that's number two. What is namima? It refers to spreading false rumors and tales, which has no authentication to it. Number three, a person who rejects the Quran and neglects his prayers. This is referring to a person who sleeps through Fajr and does not pray Fajr on time. He is disobeying the Quran since the Quran tells us, hum an salatihim sahum. Number four, one who consumes riba. Number five, wailing by the deceased family members for the deceased if the deceased asked them during his lifetime to practice wailing after his death, then this can be a cause of distress for him in the grave. By the way, wailing does not mean crying. It's totally halal and permissible to weep for our loved ones. However, wailing refers to the practice of screaming, yelling, shouting, and objecting the decree of Allah. This is not permissible. However, please note that if a person warned his family members against veiling over him, expressed his disapproval verbally or otherwise, then he would not be blameworthy. Number six, a person who indulges in lying. Number seven, backbiting and slandering. Number eight, an orator who doesn't practice what he preaches who doesn't practice what he preach. Number eight, arrogance, kibir. Number 10, stealing from the spoils of war. Number 11, sinna. Number 12, a person who carelessly takes debts 
and does not worry to pay them off. His punishment will be that his roof will be muallaq. It will be in distress until someone pays it off on his behalf. Astaghfirullah. All these are major sins. As you can see, many of these sins are related to the tongue. And as women, we all know how vulnerable we are when it comes to misusing our tongues. May Allah forgive us. May Allah protect us. Um, according to the scholars, the list is actually more exhaustive than this because there are other kadai as well. If one indulges in them, he can receive the punishment in his grave unless a person dies in a state of repentance. May Allah forgive us and protect us. Um, so the concept of na'im of qadr and adab al-qadr can be better understood by the analogy of sleep. Two people sleeping next to each other on the same bed could be in two different states. One visualizing a good dream so he is in a state of bliss, while the other suffering due to a nightmare, so he feels distressed. However, this is going to be one's own individual experience. But for the onlookers, nothing is apparent to them. All what they can see is the fact that they are sleeping. Yet the reality of sleep is a mystery. Biologists still cannot fully explain it. Doctors and scientists, they continue to study it. The notion of life in barzakh or qabr is similar. The body experiences happiness or punishment in the grave, which is an unknown reality to people who are alone. So the next question is, will a person receive this punishment until the day of resurrection or for a limited time? Again, Wallahu alam Allah knows best. There are few ahadith which do mention about the fact that they will be punished till the day of resurrection. However, the ulama, they have extrapolated that this punishment will be given in accordance to the amount of sin that was done by this individual without repentance. Also, we should remember that the time zone of Barzakh is completely different to our worldly time since it is outside the vicinity of this earth. It is not time bound due to the rotation of the earth. So that time is going to be different and Allah knows best. So now, now that our hearts are overwhelmed with fear, we question, is there anything that we can do to protect ourselves from adab al-qabr? The answer is yes. Yes, there is. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us three things. Number one, reciting Surah Al-Mulk. It was the norm of the Prophet ﷺ to recite Surah Mulk every night before going to bed. So each one of us must have this in our to-do list. Hashtag, memorize Surah Mulk. It is only 30 ayat. We can do it if we memorize one ayah per day, will be done within a month. If not, you can make a goal to memorize it, one ayah per two days in order to have revision and you'll be done in two months. However, you can take longer and inshallah make sure that even if you memorize one ayah per week, Inshallah, you will be able to accomplish your goal. But do keep this in mind. We can recite it in our salah, 
inshallah, when we pray Aisha, so that we can get the reward of a long qiyam. Or, yes, it is permissible to recite it outside our salah as well. But if we wish to protect ourselves from the torment of the grave, then yes, we have to take the necessary measures for it. We have to put in some effort for it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Surat Tabarak Hiyal Mani'atu Min Adab Al Qabr. Surat Tabarak is the protector from the torment of the grave. Number two, doing good deeds. Doing good deeds. We learn from the hadith in Sahih ibn Hibban that if a person is a believer, then the prayer will stand by his head in the grave. His zakah will stand to his right. And the fasting is going to protect him by his left. The righteous deeds, such as charity, keeping relations, with kith and kin and acts of kindness to people will serve for him against the torment of the grave. And that's why we should hasten to perform as many good deeds as possible, inshallah. Number three, making dua. The Prophet sallallahu would supplicate to Allah against the torment of the grave at the conclusion of each and every salah. And we should memorize this dua as well and recite it after our tashahud in salah. And the dua is, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adab al-qabr wa min adab jahannam wa min fitnat al-mahya wal namat wa min sharri fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave. From the punishment of the hellfire, from the trials of life and death, and from the evil of the trial of the false Messiah. Amen. So these are the things that are in our control and we can hasten to do them. However, there are certain things which can entitle a believer's security from the torment of Al-Qadr. What are they? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us, number one, a person who passes away on the day of Jama. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a believer dies on the day or evening of Jama, Allah protects him from the trial of the grave. SubhanAllah. Now, one may question, what about all those people who died on any other day? except Friday. What about them? Well, a believer should be always optimistic. If someone passes away on the day of Jum'ah, Alhamdulillah. And if someone does not, we cannot be judgmental. We still say Alhamdulillah. Because everyone cannot possibly die on Yawm al-Jum'ah, isn't it? Even our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when did he pass away? He passed away on a Monday. All the companions and the tabi'un, they did not die on a Friday. So this is something which Allah has already predestined. But as believers, we should be optimistic and we can pray to die on Yawm al We can pray for that. And inshallah, the main goal should be that Ya Allah, Please grant all of us a good death. Ya Allah, capture our ruh in a state that you are pleased with us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is pleased with us. Amen. Number two, the one who passes away due to an abdominal disease. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he who is killed by disease in his abdomen will not be tortured in his way. From this, subhanAllah, the scholars conclude that those believers who died due to painful illnesses, such as cancer 
cardiac issues, tumor, etc., will be inshallah, 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 secured from the torment of the grave. Inshallah. Number three. According to some scholars, this includes the children as well, who passed away before puberty. So now that we have discussed Al-Barzakh, we may wonder what about all those people who passed away via drowning or burning, who are not buried in their graves? Will they undergo the fitna of Qadr or Azab al-Qadr? The answer is yes. Keep in mind that the questioning in the grave and the punishment or bliss of the grave is not happening in the realm of dunya. It's happening in Barza. How can we say that? Because if you were to dig up a grave right now, you will not see any bliss. You will not see any torture. So when we talk about people who are not buried, they still undergo fitna al-qadr. And if need be, then adab al-qadr as well. How do we know this? The evidence is the ayah of Quran in Surah Ghafir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so Allah protected him from the evils they plotted and the people of Fir'aun were enveloped by the worst of punishment. The fire, they are exposed to it morning and evening. And the day the hour appears, it will be said, make the people of Pharaoh enter the severest punishment. This is an explicit evidence that even though the body of Pharaoh is not buried, even though the bodies of his soldiers who drowned in water is unknown, yet Allah tells us that they are being exposed to the fire every morning and evening. And on the day of judgment, they will be exposed to a further, more severe punishment. So according to the scholars, this ayah is a clear evidence of adab al qadr so now, subhanAllah, after discussing all this, what do we conclude? We should always conclude with some action points for us, some pointers. So what are they? Pointer number one, while we are alive, let us hasten to repent. Let us prioritize our time to please Allah, to serve humanity, to emulate our prophet, to fix our dealings, to correct our shortcomings. Because we don't know how much time do we have. Let us improvise and plan it wisely. Pointer number two, making dua for the deceased. The living go on, but the dead do not. Out of sight, out of mind, is our case because at times we completely neglect the deceased on the premise that they are dead and at rest. We forget or pretend to forget that they are in fact in even greater need of us than the living. We forget the fact that they are facing the future all alone, hidden away in the domain of the earthworms buried under the earth in an isolated grave. So it is very important that we remember our loved ones in our du'as. It's mentioned about one of the salaf, his name was Bashar bin Ghalib. He said, I saw Rabra, perhaps he, uh, she was uh, his sister, on whose behalf I used to make frequent supplication in a dream. She said to me, O Bashar, your gifts have been brought to me on plates of light, covered in silken cloth. I asked, how can that be? She replied, that is what the supplication of the living believers is like. When they make supplication for a dead person, 
that supplication is answered for them on plates of light, wailed in silken cloth. Then they are brought to the dead person for whom the supplication was said, and they are told, this is the gift of soul and soul to you. SubhanAllah. Wouldn't you wish to gift your loved ones something special? Wouldn't we wish that? Yes, we do. And what could be a better gift than supplication, than dua, when they entirely need it? When they desperately need it? However, it's sad but true that many a times we are standing for Salatul Janaza and we don't even know the dua for the deceased. So let us memorize it and say it every single day. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us a very comprehensive, beautiful dua that includes all the deceased and the living ones as well. And the dua is, Allahumma gfir li hayyina wa mayyitina wa shahidina wa ghaidina wa sagheerina wa kabirina wa dhakarina wa unthana. Allahumma man ahyaytahu minna fa ahihi ala al-Islam wa man tawaffaytahu minna fa tawaffahu ala al-Iman. Allahumma la tahrimna ajrah wa la tudillana ba'dah. O Allah, forgive our living and our dead, those present and those absent, our young and our old, our men and our women. O Allah, whom amongst you you keep alive, then let such a life be upon Islam. And whoever amongst us you take to yourself, then let such a death be upon faith. O oh Allah, do not deprive us of this reward and do not let us go astray after him. Amen. So it's a beautiful dua to memorize since it offers a complete package. Dua for them and for us. May Allah accept our humble efforts and forgive our shortcomings. Amen. The Prophet Wasallam also taught us a supplication to be recited if we happen to visit a graveyard. And the dua is, Assalamu ala ahli diyar, min al mu'mineen wal muslimin, wa yarham Allahu al mustaqdimin minna wal mustaqhirin, wa inna insha Allahu bikum lalahiqun. Peace be on the dwellers of these places, of believers and Muslims. May Allah have mercy upon the earlier and later among us. We will certainly follow you when Allah wills. So it is a reminder that we are going to die. So each time we see a funeral, we should remember that perhaps tomorrow it could be me. Perhaps next month or next year it could be us. So with that said, inshallah, we will conclude our class till our next episode. I will leave you with the cliffhanger that inshallah, we will meet each other on the day of Qiyamah for our next stop on our item, inshallah. So please stay on board. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka, 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 wa natubu ilayk. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا أذاب النار اللهم آنس وحشتي في قبري اللهم ارحمني بالقرآن العظيم واجعله لي إماما ونورا وهدى ورحمة اللهم ذكرني منهما نسيت وعلمني منهما جهلت وارزقني تلاوته آناء الليل وآناء النهار واجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته